so fast I feel like I've made it. I've never used this before. <laughs> so make sure you get a good photo of me with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'll probably see a lot of me today. I think there'll be quite a number of design panels today, and I'm very much into design. Uh, but I'll just start by asking my fellow panelists to come on stage. So the first one is Oluwatobi Akindunjoye. I hope I didn't mess it up. So he's a senior UX designer at eHealth Africa. Please welcome him to the stage. <laughs> My second panelist is Sharon Wangari. She's an impact designer at Nairobi Design Institute. <laughs> My third panelist is Mr. Charles Momani. He's the head of technology and innovation at Coachella. Uh, Coachella is one of our sponsors. <laughs> And then last but not least, it's uh, Joy Kendi. She's a design thinker and scrum master at I, I have software consulting, so she's actually part of my team. A bit of nepotism, but you'll forgive us. Okay, thank you, thank you. So uh, we'll just start, so the way we'll go about it, uh, I know a lot of the people in the room are devs and designers, and I think a few people are actually into the design thinking space. So we'll just talk a bit more about why it matters, especially in the technology space, and then share a bit more about our experiences. And last but not least, uh, wrap up with why it's actually not picking up yet. Uh, we believe it's something that people should use. So, uh, Quickly, I'll allow each participant to introduce themselves uh, in 30 seconds, what you do and, yeah. So who wants to go first? Momani. Uh, good morning. Um, I head uh, the technology and innovation at Coachella. So what we do, we do payments, and we also do apps for financial institutions and, uh, and microfinance uh, and circles, yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Sharon. Um, I am a designer, as Kimi mentioned, with Nairobi Design Institute, and what I do there is I lead the projects on the client side and on the fellow side. For anyone who doesn't know NDI, um, it is a design school that teaches full stack design. Oh, there's full stack design. It's a yeah. term we just call <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Toby. I'm a user experience designer at EOT Africa. Um, EOT Africa is an organization that actually builds health systems. So we use data-driven solutions to respond to local needs of um, remote communities. So we build health systems that actually track vaccine delivery, reduce diseases, and stuff like that. Uh, my name is Joy Kendi. I'm a design thinker and agile project manager at iHub Software Consulting. And we are a design-led company that is offering premium software design and development solutions to clients across Africa. Okay. Uh, so as not to make it too serious and too formal, in addition to introducing yourself, can you just tell us one thing we don't know about you, but that's not related to work? Yeah. Joy, you can go first now that you have the mic. Not related to work? Yes. Uh, with the mic, like, probably. I, I have to think about that. Um, so something interesting about me, I was planning DevCraft. Oh. <laughs> OK. OK, I love swimming a lot. Okay. I am one of the biggest Batman fans out there. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I'm a swimmer. I know that's cheating. You already <laughs> said it. It's no, say like something it. else. It's not a, it's no, it's it's like uh, hiking. Really? Yes. Okay, he's lying. I know him. He's never <laughs> hiked in his life. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. That's okay then. So uh, probably the next question would be, uh, I think many designers, people think of us as sticky warriors. Like, I, and I think it's also our fault. A lot of the photos that we share and the things that we talk a lot about involve using a lot of stickies and um, uh, wearing like bright clothes. But what is it actually about? Like, what did you say? What, what is design thinking and why does it matter? So I'll probably direct this question to Sharon and Odua Tobion. Yeah. Okay, so basically, um, design thinking is just 
a user-centered approach to actually solving problems. So what that means is uh, you're trying to solve a problem, but then you're going to consider three basic things. The first thing is, uh, is this desirable to the user? And the second thing is, is this a viable business opportunity? And the third thing is, is it technically feasible? So at the intersection of these three different considerations is where design thinking falls in. So it's more of a mindset, actually, whereby you're trying to build something that is viable, that can sell, because that's the only way you can actually have a sustainable business to go on with it, that is technically feasible, because that's the only way engineers can get to build it, and then that is desirable to the users, because that's the only way you can actually get customer loyalty, retention, and stuff like that. So that is what design thinking is to me. <coughs> So I'm of a similar opinion, I think just to add on what he just said, um, one of the things that design thinking or design in general needs to do is it needs to work in synergy with all the other processes in your company. So not thinking of design thinking as just a separate item or something that you outsource, but seeing how, let's look at the tech aspect, the business development aspect, and then let's look at design and how all those things could work together to create value for your user, um, that's your customer, and for the company. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe something that I didn't mention before the panel commenced. Uh, so Charles is not, I would say, a practicing design thinker. Okay, not that he's not a very bright guy. That's not the point. Uh, uh, compared to the rest of the panel, I think uh, all the other guys have actually gone through the process of like learning about it by doing a course or something, but uh, probably Charles comes a bit more from the school of hard knocks in like learning the design process or like how to build products that people actually use. So what would, you, what would be your perspective of design and building products in general? Yeah, so um, actually I think of it differently. Okay. And uh, design thinking does not only apply mm. in the tech industry. It goes beyond that, and it's generally how you approach solving problems. So first of all, it needs to make sense to the guys you're targeting. Mm. And from the products that we've done, we've actually seen that it really goes a long way, and it ensures you're actually solving the user's problem. So first of all, you need to engage them, find out how they want it to be done. Then even as you build it, you need to have constant um, touch points with the, with the users and the feedback you incorporate in the, the solution that you're building. Okay, cool. Uh, before I continue, uh, within the room, how many devs do we have? If you describe yourself as a developer, back-end, front-end, mobile, just lift, it's okay. Uh, how many people do we say we are visual designers? Like you do graphics, you make things look beautiful. Just one, okay, one, two, Okay, what, what, three? Uh, what do the rest of the guys do? <laughs> Just shout out what you do. Maybe, sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, are there any design thinkers in the room apart from the ones here? Just lift your hand up. Okay, I'm just trying to get a feel of like the audience that we have because it's going to really shape my next question. Uh, when you think about the process of building and shipping products, it be digital or non-digital, uh, in the traditional sense, we've always had like the people who think through what to be built and then the, so, the people who implement it. So, and my, my biggest challenge has always been for a lot of the people, the, a lot of the devs that I've worked with, they usually say, you go figure out what needs to be built and then we'll build it. Why should devs and designers actually bother? Why should they go out and learn a bit more about the user? Maybe you can start with Joy. Okay, um, why you should learn about the user? Users at the end of the day are the make or break of any product, um, whether we like it or not. If they are not comfortable with the apps that you're building, if they're not um, comfortable with the solution that you've given them, then ultimately it will fail. So as developers, and I used to be a software developer initially, as developers we need to um, move away from the place where we're just reading through an SRS document, um, figuring out uh, what- What is an SRS document? A system, systems, systems 
a specifications document, basically, where you're getting the requirements um, from a client or a brief from a client. So, um, again, if, if the user is not comfortable with your product, they will drop off. They are the make or break. And often you'll find that um, the environment in which our users operate are very different from what um, developers are used to. And our tests and preferences, again, are not um, what our users um, prefer. So that is why developers need to be interested in design. OK, I'll let everyone chime in on this. OK, so I think for me, um, the, the synergy of a designer and a developer is actually what leads to a, a successful product, in the sense that um, most of the times, developers just want to write code. And when you're writing code in, 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 uh, in, in an office, that office is a fact-free environment in the sense that there is no fact there. You do not actually know what the users want. But then when you go outside and talk to actual users, that's when you actually realize that, OK, this is the exact thing that is happening. OK, for instance, I was working in a travel agency, and then they had this high bounce rate. So if you don't understand what bounce rate is, bounce rate is when a lot of people come to your users, but then a large proportion of them leave uh, without doing anything. So what actually happened was that most of the people coming to the website are affiliates, and what they do is just check prices to tell their clients. So they need to check the price and then tell, the client, tell their clients that, okay, a flight from Nairobi to Lagos cost this particular amount, if they'll be interested or not. But a normal way to approach that problem would be just trying to optimize the website without knowing what exactly is causing the high bounce rate. But if you take a look at it from a user-centered process, like you talk to your users, the why do people come on the website and then you just leave? That's the only way you can actually get to find out the exact reason behind it. And then all your optimizations wouldn't have been the ideal way to actually approach that problem. So I think when you talk to users and put um, yourself in their shoes, you'll be able to uncover a lot of potential problems that just thinking that about that top of your head won't have given you the ideal solution. So I think designers and developers should actually uh, embrace such act of actually talking to real users and letting them use the software in your presence and let you see what exactly the problem is with it. Sharon? Um, I'd like to answer that using an example of a product that I worked on. Uh, but first of all, it's so important because it allows you to like really boil down into the very nitty gritty needs that your users have and then design around those needs so that the uptake of your product is increased and like also the retention, people continuously use your product. Um, so at some point I worked on a product that aimed to increase the savings behavior within like a very small pharma community. Um, so these guys already had some sort of an idea of what they wanted to build and they started working on the prototype. So we went in to first of all test that prototype and just validate whether the whole thing was going to be feasible. And I think some of the things that were really interesting was to know that the farmers had no idea what their spending behavior was like. They were like, yeah, fine, I'll save, but I don't, I don't have any money to save. I'm not making enough. Um, and so for us, we had to take a step back and try and see, okay, so how do you allow them to understand what their spending behavior is, what their earning patterns are? Because I think if any of you has interacted with farmers, it's a very volatile industry, and just the patterns in which you earn cash and the rate at which you're spending are very different, which means you are prone to high debt um, if you're not careful with the way you're spending your cash. Um, so one, one of the things that we were able to do was, oh, that's not how you hold it. Um, one of the things that we did for them was to first take a step back and design a very simple, um, like very simple intervention that allowed them to monitor how they're earning money, at what periods they're getting money, and then how they're spending that money, and use that to leverage, and leverage that to um, incentivize them to start saving with an actual financial institution. So what was the final output of that project? So it's one of the things, is what I just said, the, mm. one of the interventions was a very simple tool that allowed them to monitor how they're spending money mm. and then how they are um, earning money at what periods. Um, and then we leveraged that to try and incentivize them to um, in increase their savings behaviors with now established and formal financial institutions. But the project is still underway, so. Okay, so probably way. just before I let Charles chime in on that too, uh, I think generally when companies are building products, there's a selfish reason for it. You want to make a profit, so like how does it that map back to the company making a profit? Or okay, 
So with this particular, and that's so true, um, and that's one of the challenges that you'll always find um, designers have when it comes to uh, working with, especially if you're, if you're an outsourced resource, um, there's always this notion of, am I actually creating impact? Does this benefit anyone? Um, or is it just a selfish thing to push a product that no one will use um, to, the, to like a mass market and then just one person is benefiting? I think what you have to understand at the end of the day is someone does need to make money. Um, and you as a designer, it's your role to make sure that as much as they're making money, optimize this product in a way that allows the user to get value from it and the company as well. Okay. Hi. Charles. So maybe I'll also give a, an example of a product we've worked on, and this is one of the banking apps. So when we started off, we put a lot of things. There's a reason why everything is where it is on an app. So you'd want everything to be there and it looks cool, but you realize you've, done, you've developed the app for yourself. So the traction on the market is, yes, this is cool, but users' transactions are not increasing. It doesn't make sense to them. To the, to, the, to the client. So you have to keep learning, and there are tools nowadays, and because of that you get to know which features the users want to see the most, and it, 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 it gives you the direction of what needs to be there, where, and then that's how now you, they call it agile, so you keep developing it because you know this is what the user wants anytime they want to come on the app. So there's, there's a, at the, when you started we had things like news, forex, mm. it, Everything was there. Did anyone read that, those? There were guys who were accessing it, mm. actually. Mm. Guys who were not customers of that client. Mm. But over time, because of the feedback, guys were getting, it was too cumbersome for them to get to what they really came to the app to do. Their money. So, yes, to check their balance or statement and all that. So, um, and it has driven us, even in how we do our products, we've changed. So first of all, before we start, uh, developing, and I think that's where the synergy needs to grow between the the designers and the developers. So you need to really know why you're doing it, yeah, and you're not doing it for yourself. You might like it, but it's not a solution for techies. It's for users out there. Okay, fair yeah. point. Okay, I think I skipped something. What's the design process itself? Because I think uh, when each of you were talking, you touched on very ma many different elements of it. You've talked about the dev team, you've talked about the custom. What's the design process and how do you actually go about it? Uh, I'll let the other half of the panel answer that. Okay, um, design thinking is a very iterative process and um, the way it begins although it never really ends, is by empathizing with the user. That means um, getting to know who your user is, what do they think, what do they feel, um, why do they need your help, if at all they need your help, and understanding um, the problem from the lens of the user then helps you build um, useful products. And so as a first stage of empathizing, um, usually the design process then tends to go into defining the problem and then now I am um, ideating. And by ideating, you just generate a couple of ideas um, based on the challenges the user is facing. And then you begin to prototype um, on those ideas. And again, that's an agile process, as um, Charles mentioned. So you come up with a prototype that could potentially help your user, go to the field, test it out, um, validate it. If it works, then um, you can go on to implement. Um, but there are times um, you'll find that your prototype does not meet the user's needs, and then again you need to um, iterate over your ideas. Uh, maybe, Oliver, let me slightly tweak the question for you. Uh, from how Joy is talking about it, it sounds expensive. Is it expensive? And how do you actually deal with the fact that many people, for example, and this is also from my experience running a consultancy company, uh, you suggest to someone that uh, you have a TOR, but we don't think what you want build will actually work. Why don't we do research first before we? How do you actually deal with the fact that it's perceived to be expensive and takes a long time? Yet, uh, as a dev team, you could just sit for four weeks and have a product out there. Okay, to me, I think it's actually expensive not to do user research because on the long run, you, you might build something that users don't necessarily need. So uh, though some of these uh, approaches might actually be expensive, like going out to talk to users and the timeline might not afford you that such opportunity, 
but there are still a lot of um, methods that you can use to actually get feedback. So for instance, if you are building uh, a savings app, for instance, and uh, <coughs> you necessarily don't have that bandwidth or time to go talk to users, you can just check for similar apps on Play Store and check reviews that people already list on the current um, apps in the, in the Play Store. So um, it's, it's not necessary that you go to talk to physical users if you don't have the time or bandwidth, so because some, some stakeholders might need to show something to a potential investor. So I actually understand that there, is, there might not be time. But then there are inexpensive ways of actually doing user research. But the point is user research must be done. Because if you don't do user research, you're going to make a lot of assumptions based on yourself. And you're not designing for yourself. You're designing for a user, which most of the times you guys have different priorities. As a developer, you, your level of uh, technology, uh, your kind of the things you read had actually made you uh, a kind of different person entirely. But then the person you are designing for does not have such technological expertise. So if you are now making considerations for them, and if you are making decisions for them without actually consulting them, then you might end up building a product that will be worse than what is already available on the market. And if you are building something that is worse than what's already available on the market, there is no way anybody will come to you and use your product. So it's actually expensive not to do user research. And some of the times, people, <laughs> people, people give um, free traffic to their competitor in the sense that someone is trying to use your app, but then because your app does not make sense, and Google will now start suggesting to them that these are the similar applications and stuff like that. So you're just giving free traffic to your computer. So it actually makes a lot of sense to do user research, no matter how small, no matter what your budget is. Do it and make sure you have a level of insight. You have what customers are talking about, about what currently exists, before you spend a lot of time in building your product. OK, um, maybe to, again, slightly change it. And it's something that I've always noticed. So in the beginning, when you're building a product, uh, people talk a lot about user research and the need to do it. How then do you continue that culture after you have your first version of the product? And are there like specific techniques that you use to ensure that you never lose sight of the user? Because, I mean, it makes a lot of sense for many of us when we have a new idea to do the research, to go and talk to customers. But more often than not, once we ship it, we now just sit back and continue coding. So what do you do after, like now after you have your first version? Like how do you continue doing the design thinking part? Uh, it's a tough one, but um, I think you continuously engage the customers, mm. the users. How? Um, yeah, you are. Like, do you little randomly walk and then, are you customer come? No. <laughs> you actually, and you, you don't engage with guys you know. Mm. Like, you get random and you yeah. actually have to have, like, um, I don't know what they call them, but mm. different categories. Mm. They are, like, what they do in, a, in the in the industry we are in, yeah. you get different edge sets, mm. guys of diff different income so levels. So segmentation. You segment and okay. you get guys in different rooms mm. so that they don't, you see how they interact with your product. Oh, okay. And it doesn't mean that it ends there. Mm. So what people like today mm. may not necessarily be what, be what they, they like, like to next tomorrow. year or mm. tomorrow. Mm. So you have to continue doing that because your app can be the best today. And then the tomorrow worst. is the worst. Yeah, because Oluwatobi went to your reviews and he was like, yeah. hmm, they like this and this, and they don't like this, and then you did a better version of it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So if you don't continuously engage, mm. and then um, maybe to also add on to it, you know, at the end of it, we are still humans. Mm. So depending on uh, the environment that you are in, you are tempted to do things the way you are used to. Yeah? And the environment is different for everyone. So like say you are working in a banking mm -hmm. environment, yeah? So there are processes, there are policies and things have to be done in a certain right. way, there are risk, whatever else. Then you want to do this cool product that you think every user out there would, would want to use. But the problem is if you don't engage them, you would do it the way the processes work within the environment. Mm -hmm. Then when it gets out there, the customers don't understand what that is. And maybe they actually need it. So 
it's really important to continuously engage. Okay, uh, before Sharon chimes in on that, uh, there's something interesting that Momani talked about, uh, not testing with people that you know, and I totally agree with it. Uh, have you ever wondered how people get the confidence to go to a singing show and yet they can't sing? Have you ever wondered why? So it's their friends. They keep telling them, wow, you can sing well. <laughs> And then you end up on TV <laughs> and you can sing. So, Sharon? So, I haven't gotten a chance to work like on a long term product. I'm always more on the getting it to a development phase and then um, handing it over back to the clients. But one of the things that I've observed most people do, and it's a really effective way of continuously monitoring what um, your users are doing, is just Go on these basic platforms where they are. Do they use Facebook? Do they use Twitter? Do they, are they on um, Instagram? What are the new trends? What are people saying? You can infer a lot from the kind of things that people enjoy doing and where they hang out and things like that, and then use that kind of data to pivot your product or to just add a new feature or to remove something that doesn't really work for your market segment. OK. Uh, cool. We'll just continue the same vein, but in a slightly different way. Uh, from my interaction and talking to different people, there's this assumption that uh, the design approach is very qualitative, like it doesn't account like data. And I think it's a wrong assumption. So maybe y you can also share a bit. Like how does the data part play in that bigger scheme of creating products that work well? And as a designer, how do you actually leverage that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the whole uh, design thinking methodology actually uh, focuses on uh, quantitative and qualitative data. So qualitative is actually w what people say. So those reviews are actually qualitative, and uh, the quantitative is the numbers, like how many people actually download your app and stuff like that. And I refuse to agree that um, designers don't use quantitative data. I think it depends on the project and it depends on your company. Uh, companies like Facebook, Booking, Amazon, and those stuff that have a lot of data. For instance, if you're trying to, to, to post an ad on Facebook, they're going to tell you that the image you've used has more than 25% text. And so they will not approve that ad. The only reason they can place such restriction is because over time, they've tested different ads and have come to the conclusion that ads that have a lot of text do not usually get engagement. People will not click on them. So they now make it simpler for you that if you're using an imagery, people, people like to see visual things and people are visual, so they will actually click on it. So actually using quantitative data to make decisions is actually something that, that actually works well. And I think people use it a lot. Though in this part of the world, we, we, we don't really do that much, but then designers actually use quantitative data to make decisions. And for instance, if you're, if you're doing an A-B test, which is you trying to check which version of two uh, options actually work better. So if what you are testing, for instance, is the layout, if you have the text at the top and the image and the button, or if you have the image at the top, the text and the button, and you're trying to test which of these two versions would actually let people download or click the button more. The quantitative data is actually the easiest way to go about that because you can't start asking people now which one would you click. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Because if you ask them that which one would you click, they're going to give you an answer based on what they feel at that moment. You get? But if you actually just do an A-B test whereby both versions goes to 50% of your own, one goes to 50% of your users, the other goes to 50% of your users, and they actually click because they think that's a real thing, and they would behave the way they would actually naturally behave. That's what we call contextual in inquiry in the sense that it is based on the context of how they would behave without an external uh, observer. So once you observe these two different variations, you can then see which amount of um, clicks version A gets, which amount of clicks version B gets. Then it's, it's a no-brainer. If you see that this version has 80% and this one has 60%, then you know that you're going for this version on the live website, which everybody would now eventually see. So I think quantitative data, is, even in email marketing, people do the same thing. They test different versions of subjects and stuff like that. So I think for things like that, quantitative data is the way to go. And you can actually use qualitative data for that. OK. Uh, does anyone else want to chime in on that? Or do we think Oluwatobi has 
like done a good job. Okay, so this sounds all good, but and also from my interactions within the Kenyan tech ecosystem, very, very few companies use this approach. Why do we think so? Why, why isn't it picking up? Is it that it's hard? Is it the sticky note part? Is it the sketching part? Is it the work? Like, why, why is, it, is it not picking up? Um, for me, I'd say even the name design thinking itself scares off people. Um, when you asked how many designers are in the room, um, most people tended to think it's either graphic design or front-end development. So, so just should the, we change the name? Maybe. I, I mean, uh, people will associate the design part with only designers, so we'll um, be scared of using the design thinking. And for, okay, I don't know anyone who's scared of thinking. Um, so it's mostly <laughs> the design thing. Um, I think what needs to happen is that design thinking needs to be encouraged in companies as a cross-functional team um, thing. So developers need to think of themselves as designers. Um, marketing people need to think of, of themselves as designers because what happens in design thinking sessions is that we bring together um, people, whether they are a CEO or like one of the projects um, I've worked on for the past two years um, included pastoralists in the design thinking workshop. And they were very um, critical in helping us design um, the app that you are designing because what we had in mind is not for example, what they relate certain symbols with looking at it from an app. So I think one of the challenges is um, the correlation people have um, with innovating solutions and just um, for them thinking that it's designers who should solve that problem. Um, I, I think the second challenge is that uh, a lot of large organizations have the product out approach. Um, we've always been told, um, build it and they will come. And I've seen this. They never um, come. They never come. Um, and I've seen this a lot, actually, with uh, banks in Kenya, where they are trying to push out um, products to the youth, and then one year later, they are back complaining that um, the app didn't work. Um, so yeah, those are some of the challenges um, with implementing design thinking, especially in Kenya. OK, so uh, I think. Um, over the course of uh, my working with developers, I think I've only had the opportunity to work with one developer that is design-minded. Most of the times, if you don't give a developer how a screen should look, they will go for the worst option. And you're like, is it intentional? <laughs> like, can't you just come up with something that's even like average? They usually go for the worst option. So I think it's, it's a mindset thing. Like, developers are not usually wired towards the visual aspect of things. They are more towards the functional aspect of things. So it, it's hard to actually get them on board to even involve them in user research and stuff like that. But uh, one thing that has worked for me in the past was to, so for instance, we have customer care agents, people that chat with customers and all of that. So one of these days I just took a developer and then, okay, come and see the way a customer is chatting with one of our customer agents. And the person was like, just trying to book a flight and then, the forms are too many. The form that she has already filled, so the traveler name and the person booking the flight is actually the same name, but then she had to fill it twice. So instead of just adding a button that says, you can just click on this checkbox if you are the same person that is actually going to be on the flight. And that saves the whole issue of trying to fill it. But developers now start thinking of, so they just want everything to be bulky so that they will know that they're actually working and they're writing many lines of code. So one thing I did was to bring in there and when you saw things like that, not just from one person, not just from two people, then there's this sort of empathy that actually made the developer more user-centric. But ideally, developers are not very user-centric and I don't think it's something that, you can't change their DNA, you get what I'm saying? So you just have to work with them and try as much as possible to involve them in that process. Sharon? Cool. First, I'd like to start by asking anyone in the room, what do you think design thinkers do? Yeah, on a daily basis. A volunteer. OK. <coughs> Talk Sorry. a lot with people. Cool. Oh. Yeah. Anyone else want to give it a go? Yes. Actually, mine is more question, if I may. Um, there's this famous thing that, OK, 
Actually, uh, just hold on. Can we get a mic to you? Okay. Murigi? Thanks. Um, mine is more of a question uh, in the line of uh, there's this famous quote of Henry Ford, I think it was, who said that, okay, if we had actually gone out and asked people how they would like their car designed, then they would have said something along like uh, faster, you know, uh, horse driven carts, whatever. How do you call these things? Faster. They would have horses. wanted faster yeah. horses. Faster horses, basically. So how does this uh, fit together with the very going out and asking people how to do stuff approach? Okay. Um, actually, before you continue, there's an interesting thing that Kenyans do. Uh, when you ask someone, how's life, how's business, what do they say? Fine. Do they ever say, like, by then, no, it's really, really bad. Did they ever say that? No. Okay, Sharon, cool. you can answer that and continue. Okay, well, um, I think answer that. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to pause on that question for a second, and then we, I think we'll all come back to it at some point. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I ask that is because, like Joy said, design thinking or design thinkers are seen to be like something that's completely outside the norm. But like in the context of asking people questions, asking people, so what do you, um, how, what are what are your spending habits, or how do you prioritize um, your household items or whatever? What is stopping you as a business developer or a market person or even a scientist from doing those things? There's absolutely nothing that's stopping you from doing that as a person who's in a completely different industry. And I think it's something that we continuously do. You're just not aware that you're doing these things. Um, I feel like I stood away from the question. But like in the same line of thought, um, I think the reason why design as a practice has, been, has had a really slow uptake within especially local businesses in Kenya is because it's seen as an outside resource. You sit at a table with your business developers and your market people, um, and then you decide, okay, so we need to design a website. Let's get someone to do that. And then only looking at design as this very linear item, like it's just to do the visuals, not seeing design as a wholesome um, really unit that is in, like very essential for every part of the design, of every single process within your company. And to that, to like the same point, um, this really boils down to the need of having designers being invited to the table to strategize around product strategies and how do we, how do we like, you know, create the next iteration, how do we pivot our product, which just is currently not happening in the Kenyan markets. Okay, uh, we'll circle back to that question, uh, but maybe for Charles, especially having worked, uh, he's actually worked a lot. And any time he goes on leave, he doesn't go back to the old company. So if you ever work with him, don't give him leave. <laughs> so having worked in the financial sector a lot, uh, and even from my experience working with banks, it's always been difficult to get them to fully, not, not, not even just to fully, even to just embrace the design process. So what do you think is the challenge, especially for that sector, and how has Coachella actually gone about it? Because you actually play in that sector purely. Yeah. So, um, it's not entirely true that <laughs> I always leave. But, uh, yeah, I think part of it I'd already mentioned. Mm. Um, and maybe to give a, a short uh, story, I think you've had it before, if you're a fan of uh, Steve Jobs. There's a time you were saying um, there's a company that used to do great things. Mm. Then they look back at a product that they, they really did well mm. and saw what they did to get that great product. Mm. And they actually made it to be a process. And now everything else they do it that way. has to follow that process. process. And it's the wrong approach. Whatever you do for one product does mm. not mean all of them mm. should be done the same way. So the challenge we have like with big institutions, and um, I think it's not all financial institutions that don't, are not, uh, are not customer centric. Like you see some banks like Chase, guys really like them, because they used, you used to go there and they listen to you. They 
give you a loan and all that to do your business, even if you are small. But over and above that, it's about, um, you know, they have things they call targets. They have, uh, they are, there is time constraint. Mm. And then if, you're, if it's a big institution that cuts across the, the region. So you do something for Kenya, and you expect it will also work in other countries, which is not the case. The needs of customers here is very different from the needs of customers there. So conducting the research or having feedback from the users in the different segments is a costly affair. And oh, so also, cost becomes a quick yes, problem. Yes. Okay. And it's also time consuming. Mm. Now, if it's something that is mass market and is being driven, say, from a retail division, mm. they know they want to get this target by quarter one or by end of the year. So if you start talking about doing research in all these countries, mm. and it's going to take four months, they are looking at this is four months where I would have done market marketing and I would have gotten this many customers already on. on but board. do you need four months? Yeah. For now, thing is, um, even to, and that's Can where you? institutionalizing, like coming up with processes and bureaucracy sometimes is also a hindrance in the, in the process of design, thinking on in products. Because if you want someone to do research, you have to tender, like oh. it, it becomes a whole, Mess. Actually, the tendering process usually takes longer than the job yes. itself. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so to answer your other bit is now how is Coachella helping that? So the fact that we are a, we are a startup and we we know why we need to do this and we need to be in the market for the long run. So we ensure that our solutions meet the needs of the consumer. So even if we get engaged by a client to do their app, what we do on our own, we also engage uh, also you, So, But do you include that, for example, in your proposal as a budget line? Or is it something that you do like Unajitole? Like it's, it's part of money. what we do. Okay. So we might not uh, put it in the proposal, mm -hmm. but it, it will be. Or oh, it's factored into the other Yes, because okay. uh, trying to explain it to guys who have not done it before mm. becomes a challenge. So you just lie to them? No, we don't lie. Mm. You just tell them <laughs> this is how you're going to do it, mm. but you tell them things they understand. Oh, okay. So okay. the other challenge is um, some people might actually be doing it, mm. only that they don't know it's called design, design thinking. thinking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think that part is more of... Uh, our fault as designers, not really explaining and using fancy terms yeah. most of the times, yet it's something that you've always been doing as a business owner or as a dev. And in the interest of time, I'll quickly switch to his question. Uh, he talked about the quote that was misattributed to Ford, where he said if he'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. As designers, what does that mean? Who wants to go? Uh, I'm not a designer, mm. but maybe I can also ask a question to the designers. <laughs> 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 There's something that, OK, I, I, I usually follow what Steve Jobs says a lot. Mm. And there's a time when, we, when he was being uh, interviewed, I don't know by who. I think your voice is low. Oh, he said, um, mm. users don't know what, what they, they want. want until mm. you show it to them. Like iPhone was not there. There's no user who would have told you, I need an iPhone. But this guy, he was in the shoes of a user and he was also a design thinker. So like in our situation today, mm. can we still do that? Oh, okay, what? so how do we rely on our hunches? Or do we, do we always ask people what they want and what's the balance between like doing your user research and figuring out that part and just using a great idea that you think is a good idea. Yeah. So yeah, take it away. Joy, you want to go first? Um, I, I don't think as designers we ask people what they want. We ask them what their challenges are and how we can help them solve them. So um, when we started, so design thinking is a fusion of I'd say three things. The challenges the uh, user is facing, 
combined with the business um, challenges, because at the end of the day, someone needs to pay for what you're doing, and is it um, technologically feasible? So um, considering all these things, you've gone out and someone has said the horses are too slow. Um, at the end of the day, we are trying to innovate and come up with solutions, and part of design thinking is ideation. So um, as designers, I don't think um, any of us go back to the office and say, um, it's slow, they want faster horses. We go back and say, it's slow, how can we improve um, the process in which they get from point A to B um, faster? And there are several ideas that come up. It's, so it's not always um, a, a direct answer. Um, we have to um, ideate over it. Also, the key takeaway from that statement would be faster. It will not be horses. It will not be horses. They just want a faster way. Yes. So what can we um, come up with that can get them to point B um, faster or, or yeah, more easily? Uh, as, do we need to continue with that or we can open the flow? Okay, let, me, let me add something to that. So I, I think another, another thing is when you ask a user what he or she wants, uh, the answer will be limited to his or her knowledge of technical possibilities. So for instance, I wouldn't have imagined that an electric car was possible like years ago because I didn't even know something like that. We you also know? understand because you come from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you and power. Is that supposed to, is that supposed to be an insult? <laughs> so, so, so you wouldn't even so asking the user what he or she wants would only give you answers that are limited within the confines of what the technical uh, possibilities that he or she understands. Understand. So, I think another way to go about it is actually by observing the users. <clears throat> Something that happened in Nigeria years back was that we had Nokia as a leading uh, phone manufacturer. But then, because most of the telcos were not reliable, people wanted to have an option. But then Nokia phones only have one SIM slot. So people were buying an extra phone just to be able to use uh, another uh, network right. provider. This is obviously an opportunity there. The reason why someone is buying this extra phone is to be able to use a second SIM card. They, they are not even using any function on the phone. So it makes a lot of sense for you to consider, if it's technically feasible, to have a dual SIM phone. But then if you had asked the user then, they might not even know it's possible. But what they will tell you is that uh, I want another uh, network on the, same, on the same phone, for instance. But then that was what Techno did. And when Techno came with dual SIM phones, even though uh, the functionality of most of the things that included wasn't really top notch, but then for that dual SIM functionality, that was a key problem that users were facing then, a lot of people purchased the phone. And not long after, bigger companies like Samsung actually then introduced dual SIM phones. And even, even the, the, the recent Apple, yeah, yeah. The, recent, the recent Apple uh, uh, releases actually has iPhones that have dual SIM, SIM slots. So I think the, the, the main thing is not actually directly asking users what, you. What, uh, what they want or something like that. Because it, it, they would even frame the answers based on their current needs. You know what I'm saying? And it might be based on emotions. So for instance, maybe the person just had a breakup and asking him, what do you need? A girlfriend, of course. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think user observation is actually very key. So when you observe the person, the person is down, and then you can actually sense that, oh, this person needs a new girlfriend. So okay. I think user observation is actually very yeah. key. So my conclusion from that, because we need to move to Charles's question, it's what people want and what they say tend to be very different. And as designers, we need to discern what they say they want and what they actually need. So it's our job to critically think about what they said and actually derive what they meant. So Sharon, you can go first. I think Charles's question was more to do with uh, what's the balance between relying on our hunches and our ideas with now what users. So what's that balance between asking users and also like coming up with our ideas? How do you actually go around that with the design process? Okay. Let me give that a little think. Um, so, let's see. Or oh, maybe someone else wants to go first. Yeah, no, I can, okay. I can go. Um, so one of the things that, just coming back to your point, is observing people in their very natural context. Um, because you find a lot that when you talk to people and sometimes 
when they're very aware of, especially because when you're doing your research, a lot of times you tend to introduce what you're trying to achieve from that particular conversation, which can sometimes bias what they're going to say. Um, and I mean, you'll get, if you take the information that you give at first value, it's very possible that you'll end up with like one of the craziest products you've ever designed. Um, so sometimes going back to a place where you're able to observe people in the natural context and then come back to yourself as a human being. Because Actually, uh, let me interrupt you. It's more from, let me use the example of Uber. Yeah. If you look at their origins, like the story that they they talk about is uh, Travis and the other guy were in Paris and then they had a rough time like getting like around and then now that's how they came up with the idea of like uber so that, that i think it's more to do with i have an idea that i think is really good mm -hmm. I've, i haven't done any research so in the design process how do i go about it the idea is coming from me like maybe it's a problem i faced personally yeah so how then do i use the design process in that context i'm going to deflect that question yeah. from one of you guys I think that's more of product building, and uh, that's where uh, the concept of minimum viable prototype or mm. product actually comes into play. Like she earlier said, that when they started um, Camilimu, mm. there wasn't a website, there was nothing. It was just more of doing it offline and mm. trying to see how people would react. So I think in that kind of setting, it might not make any sense to go build a web app. Well, that's what most developers would do, because they have the technical capability, they will go and build the Uber app. I say Uber for Suya, Uber for this, Uber for that. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the, the, the official thing to do, or the rational thing to do, is actually to, to test the, the concept without actually building any application. Would people use this thing? Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So if you're trying to build a USSD app, you might just 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 uh, post it on Facebook or Twitter, or just run a oh, small instead of, So instead of building something. Instead of building something. So you might just run a little advert and say, you can now do this. So based on people's interest and how, because people would naturally drop comments and say, how can I do this? So you can actually measure people's interest in the problem you're trying to solve. And from this, you can then take it a, 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 a notch further instead of just building a hub straight up. Okay. So I think that's more of the minimum viable. Okay. Product. So what I'm getting is even with our ideas and our hunches, we still need to validate them exactly. and figure out the cheapest way to do it. Sure. So not investing in an app. Okay. Except yeah, Max Gabbard, you can just build it straight up. Okay. Uh, you want to chime in or can I? Okay. Questions? There's someone at the back and someone here in the front. And please make it a question. So um, my question is, I'd say to the entire panel. Can, I can't hear you. Um, my question is to the entire panel. So um, personally, I'm a developer and you came from working on the code. And recently, you've been dealing with the clients, hearing the problems, etc. So you've been, I'd say I've had issues trying to communicate and come up with say, a bridge between what the client wants and how we can develop it. So how have you handled that across the different projects you've worked on? How have you developed the feature list that, in such a way that both the client and your devs can understand? OK. Who wants to go first? How do you, basically, how do you communicate to your client? And the interesting thing, I think it's, it's, it's a problem we have in technology. So I was hanging out with a friend the other day, and then I was communicating that like, I don't want to, take, like, to do this thing because I don't have the mental bandwidth. It's only the two of us who understood what that meant. Everyone else didn't understand like, what is bandwidth in that context. So how do you actually go about that communication element? I don't think that's a design um, thinking issue as such. Um, as Kiri has mentioned, um, what I'd advise is that you get a cross-functional team if you're able to. Um, get someone who's able to translate what the user is saying, um, or rather what the developers are saying, um, decode it into English, and then communicate that to the user. Are, um, are you accusing him of not knowing English? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I mean, um, sometimes we tend to be very technical, and the user or the client does not understand what you're saying. So um, if you're completely unable to understand one another, I'd advise you get um, diversify your team, um, get someone who's able to um, translate 
um, what one is saying to the other. Okay, I, I think. Hello? Yeah. Okay, so I think it depends on the client. So I think the first thing to actually do when you have a client is to actually see if you can work with that client. So if you think it's a client you can work with, then you should have a rough idea of the problem space. What I mean by that is if you've not worked on any health project before, and then someone's bring, uh, someone brings an health project, if you're not interested, just say you're not interested, but if you're interested in exploring that health project, you need to make that extra effort to of, mm -hmm. of researching about it so that once you're talking to the client, he or she would know that you actually have an idea what you're talking about. What I found is that when clients see that you don't even know what you're talking about, like you don't have a, a, a deep knowledge of the problem space, then they can just start throwing things at you that they want this, they want this. But if you are able to give them like an informed decision or like a fact and tell them that, okay, we cannot place hamburger menu here because based on this is what will happen. So I think that way, if the client still now says, go ahead, then I think that's a dictator, not a client. So. And especially in the design, like in the design context, not really, um, on, around developers is one, one way that I found super effective to engage clients is to invite them to a workshop or just like a sit down where you talk about the project. Uh, this is before you kick off. And that's been really helpful to us guys because in a way you get them to, because design can be, it, has, it can be very technical sometimes. So you get them to a place where they understand the different activities that you will carry out, um, the kind of materials that you'll be using and in a way they get to see that this is just everyday stuff. And a lot of times we've always found that clients live feeling super happy and throwing around all these words to us like, oh, tell me about those personas, which again becomes super exciting for us guys. Child. Yeah, so I think I understand where you come from and we face that a lot. Um, I think it's good also to understand your client and what they really want to do. Aside from that, depending on the product you're building, it's good to, to look at the timelines and what is really feasible within the time that you need to do the solution. And communicate that effective, effectively to the client and let them know that we can only achieve this much at this time. So the other interesting thing is um, there are some clients who know they want something, but uh, they don't know fully how it will be. But once you start showing them, then an idea comes to mind. So you can find yourself in a situation where a project is never ending. So it's really good that you define what really needs to go out first, then the other features you can keep on adding as you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was another question here. Hello, hi everyone, I'm George Olak. So my first question is uh, to maybe Kenyan designers, what we tend to have is uh, design thinking. At what point do we get to, okay, now this is what we created from the film. Now we need to turn these ideas into something that can be presented to the developers. Most of the time we tend to skip that bit, and that bit is really important. Like, what are you doing to make that possible? Secondly, to the Nigerian guy, since he worked a lot with developers, uh, in a situation where you design something, but the developer cannot implement, how do you go about it? Yeah. Okay. So first one is on communicating from your, f you've done your field research, how do you move that to your design team? The Kenyan ones. <laughs> yeah, you go first. Okay, um, I think I I'll keep saying this. Uh, we need to stop looking at design thinking as a designer's functionality. And remember, it's a cross-functional um, team that's working on a project. Um, I'll, I'll give an example of one of the design thinking methodologies um, that was started by Google Ventures called a design sprint, which is basically a design workshop over five days. And in that workshop, we'll have designers and developers in the room, as well as users and the business. And what will happen on Monday, Tuesday, is that we'll understand the problem, um, come up with ideas, and um, on Wednesday, we'll co-design. Everyone in the room will um, sketch something, um, whether you're a user, whether you're a CEO, 
or a developer. And what happens on Thursdays is that designers and developers then work together to come up um, with a prototype. It could be a mobile app or a website. And then on Friday, we test that with um, actual users. So that's one of the ways um, designers and developers can work together. Um, when it comes to field research, um, what happens is that we'll bring our insights back um, to the office, um, compile a report with recommendations, and then um, the user, um, the UX researcher will work with a designer again to come up with um, wireframes and storyboards. So um, we'll draw out a screen of what we recommend would work for the users, and um, we sit down with the developer um, to transition um, the UI to actual code. Okay, Sharon? It's similar to what Jay said. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Design thinking is not, it's not like a, a methodology for a specific set of people. It does not just fall for designers. You as a developer can be a design thinker. You are a design thinker. Um, and when it comes to understanding people's needs, going to the field and figuring out, like listening to them and hearing first hand, getting that information like as like primary data for you, it's super important because when you go back to like now thinking about, okay, so what have we heard? Um, how do we move this data into something that's meaningful? You as a developer have a big say in that as well, instead of waiting for you know someone to go to the field and then coming back and giving that data to you. So it's just like everyone should also get in the field and talk to people. Uh, and Charles, do you want to contribute? Okay. Only what Obi, you had, there was a question for you. Okay. So your question was how um, developers would implement designs that you think uh, is not possible. Yeah. Okay. So first thing is, uh, as a designer, uh, you you have empathy not just towards the user, but towards the business and also towards the developers. As I said earlier, I said design thinking is at the center of creating something that is desired by the users is viable for the business, and then it's feasible in terms of tech. So what I worked for me is actually learning like a, a bit of code. Because then, uh, sometimes on Twitter, people argue if designers should learn how to code, or if developers should learn how to design. You get what I'm saying? But I think if you appreciate the craft of the developers, and then you have um, an idea of how these things work, it would actually guide your design. And also, since design thinking is like an iterative process whereby developers can get to communicate, there's this tool I use called InVision. And what it does is, once I've built the user interfaces, the developers can actually click on them and then place comments on it. At that point, they can state if something is not feasible or not. But even before that, there's usually a brainstorming session whereby we decide on what technologies we are using, is it Angular, is it React, or something like that would, 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 like, would, would determine what technology we're using. And then the designer can go research and see what is actually possible. That's one. The second thing is actually using systems that are adopted. So if you are building something on Android, you can do material design. That way, it would be almost impossible for you to create something that developer will not be able to implement. Why? Because most of the material design guidelines actually have code snippets that the uh, developer can just copy and then customize. So I think that has worked for me. OK. Uh, before Murigi kicks us out of the stage, last word can start with Joy. OK, Charles hasn't spoken in a while. OK. Last comment, anything. Maybe you can even talk about your hobby if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Not hiking. You don't uh, hike. Maybe. It's not related to design thinking, but I think it's a discipline that you talked about when, uh, when you started before the keynote, is I think we need to embrace the craft of like the guys in the technical field. We need to have the discipline where know when to say no to a client, because it also creates some perception towards the general industry. So you do a good job, it makes it easier for oh. someone else to get a, a client and even we do great things together. Okay, yeah. perfect. For me, it will be two things. One, um, let's stray away from looking at design thinking as just a buzzword because it's it really has such a it's such a buzzword in Kenya today. Um, all these things all fall back to design, and 
design thinking is not possible without every other integral part, like the visual aspect, marketing, all these things are what build design thinking. And the second thing, oh yeah, is, so let's also move from a place where we are just getting knowledge on design thinking and reading about it to practicing it, because the best way to learn how to do this is by actually just going to the field and doing it. Okay, so for me, I think I would like us to move from the mentality of rules to mentality of ownership. What I mean by that is you just don't see yourself as a designer, and then all you want to do is just design. You don't just see yourself as a developer, and all you want to do is just write code. We should feel like a sense of ownership, and when we do that, we'll try to push ourselves beyond what we are expected to do but then create something that would actually make sense for the business and also for the users. Uh, it's a bit similar. Um, one of the foundations of design thinking is empathy. Um, so for me, when you think about empathy, think about your end user, think about the developer, think about the designer, think about the business owner. Um, how can I understand all these roles in a project and mesh them together to build um, a product that offers value to users and to the business? Okay, I think that's it. Uh, probably for me, it's, we need to change, to rework the names and go for simpler things. Yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you, guys.